Magic.me is the world's greatest school for magic, meditation, and mysticism. You can learn everything there from chaos magic to hermeticism to meditation to how to supercharge your finances and take absolute control of your destiny. In short, you get all of the tools you need to turn chaos into beautiful, scintillating order and master your life. It's incredible. You've probably heard me talk about it on the show quite a lot, but check it out. It's growing fast. And I just want to say, if you're confused about where to start, because I have so many courses there, the Adept Initiative is the place to go. The Adept Initiative is the flagship course on magic.me, and it contains everything you need to know to master the most profound ancient techniques of changing your consciousness and the most modern and cutting edge tools and systems for absolutely turning your life into a masterpiece. You are really going to dig it. Go check it out, and I will see you in class. It's magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E. Yes, hello, it's Jason Louv. Welcome back to episode 173 of the Ultra Culture Podcast. Today, we are journeying deep into the world of occultism with a very special guest, a Penn award-winning historian, writer-in-residence at the New York Public Library, and a voice that has garnered respect across academic, journalistic, and subculture circles. His name is synonymous with alternative spirituality and profound historical insights. Yes, please welcome Mitch Horowitz back to the show. His latest book is called Modern Occultism, History, Theory, and Practice, and it takes us on a vibrant, epic journey through the annals of occult history, from the magical corridors of Cleopatra's reign to the revolutionary ideas of Madame H.P. Blavatsky and the spiritual awakenings ignited by figures such as Aleister Crowley and Carl Jung. In his new book, Mitch unfolds the tapestry of hidden wisdom, the rise and influence of secret societies, the migration of magical systems, and even the often overlooked occult influences on iconic figures like Frederick Douglass and Isaac Newton. All right, the book comes out in a couple weeks, but you can pre-order it on Amazon and definitely do that because that really, really helps authors out. You know, we live in a world dominated by algorithms, you, me, and everyone we know, and Amazon's algorithm heavily favors first week sales on a book. Uh, and that really counts for everything in terms of how the book's going to do and how they're going to promote it. So go ahead and pre-order it. I definitely pre-order things that I'm ultra excited about. Uh, it's called Modern Occultism, History, Theory, and Practice. All right. So without any further ado, please join us and welcome Mitch Horowitz as we unravel the intricacies of occultism in thought and practice. How's New York these days? Hot, sticky, but managing. You know, I want shit to be open later. I miss not being able to get borscht at four in the morning. And uh, I want that New York back very badly. Can't do that anymore? No, I mean, maybe with exception here and there you can. But places that used to be open 24 hours no longer are. Places close at like midnight, you know, and it's just like... When did I fucking move to Racine, Wisconsin, you know, which, by the way, is probably open later. It's know? probably happening so, now with all the remote workers. Right. right. There's probably great places in Racine. I think um, but anyway, everything's good. Everything's good. You know, trying to figure out what my life consists of now that this book is finished. Um, and uh, it's a funny thing, you know, I mean, I'm sure you had that experience when you finished John D and Empire of Angels, you finished this massive, massive book, which, by the way, is fucking brilliant. Um, and it's this. Thank massive you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I saw the, sh the shout out uh, in the book. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate yeah. it. I, no one has ever called. No one has ever called me or my writing reliable before. So I'm still processing that. It's like, okay. Well, thank Mitch you. Horowitz, you're very reliable. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, that's reassuring. <laughs> you're the most reliable person I know. Um, that, that's scary. <laughs> that, 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 that's yeah. frightening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to get to the bottom of that 007 shit with John D. It's so childish and ridiculous. 
and it's spread throughout our culture. Anyway, forgive me, I'm 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 sort of going on one tangent to another, but having finished so massive a project, it's exciting, it's exhilarating, but it leaves you wondering, oh well, what am I supposed to do with my life? So of course I start another book, which is a little bit like Elvis going on tour again. You know, I have to be careful of that. So but that's my life. <laughs> yeah, you tour a lot. I'm always amazed you're you're uh you're a road dog. You're or you're it, always appearing. It's a lot, you know. I mean, I have this um what can I say? You know, I, I frankly don't know that I would know what to do with myself if I weren't. I've lost all capacity to relax. You know, I'm trying to rewatch the Sopranos and Cannabis Helps. It's quite fascinating. You know, it's so well written. It's beautiful. Um, but I don't know how to relax. So if I'm not I mean, I'm I'm either working or, you know, I'm hanging with uh my kids or my partner and yeah. that's uh, that's my life. I also began what not rewatching it for the for the first time watching The Sopranos. Um it's 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 really good. Uh yeah. also the while... writing is just so splendid. And um and they they I mean, as time passes, you see certain gimmicks that the writers use, but they're they're very, very good gimmicks. And um uh, I don't really mind them until very late in the run of the show. You know, you, you have to make the the kind of normies just a, a, a wrinkle worse than the gangsters, and, right. uh, or or you have to make the normies do things that that we as a public are so angry over, like denying somebody's health care claim or something. That even if the gangsters kill people, you're like, well, they don't do that. You right, know, so. right, 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 right. Yeah, my. Uh... <laughs> My my favorite is the evil grandmother in that show, who has so that's many good one liners. Tough character, yeah, she's scared. That's that's the scariest part of that show for me. I'm like, this is too, it is. This too, we had, too close. You know, a few of those in Queens, and they were not. I mean, I mean, maybe they weren't all like mafia grandmas for sure, but they had that. You know, the whole like um, loving Italian Jewish grandmother thing needs like to be placed under a microscope, and that show certainly did. <laughs> and you don't always like what you see under the microscope, but. Um, quite frankly, um, those were my recollections, minus the uh, organized crime of New, you know, growing up in New York. Time, you know, but uh, I don't think getting out of jury duty on false pretenses, <laughs> you know, quite qualifies as organized crime. That's funny. Um, Something I discourage, but that's the only thing I've ever been able to use Masonic connections for, by the way. Getting out of jury duty. Yep, but that's I'll take you don't it. Don't wind up like Peter Parker, do you? You know, you yeah. Be careful there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that's like, funny. Oh no! Then you'll use to have to use your powers of ceremonial magic to fight street crime and evil. You know. Yeah. Well, w with great power comes great responsibility, exactly. allegedly. <laughs> so apparently, you got to be a white knight. Um, but yeah, so that let's talk about your book. Maybe that's a good segue. Um, so modern occultism. It's exciting to see you. Um, focus it like getting more into like the more kind of academic ceremonial magic side of things so yeah. why don't we just start off? i just got the book so i've been able to read into it but not the whole thing um why don't we start out with why you decided to write this one specifically and then i, I just want to talk about also what your take is on this stuff coming from the new thought world because i kind of went the opposite direction i think new thoughts a lot more practical a lot of the times but yeah i'm yeah. definitely curious in, about that well i'm eager to talk about all that well the the inception of the project was through a 12 part digital class i was doing for the theosophical society called modern occultism and to my surprise it turned out to be very popular uh, and it also placed a demand on me to go beyond the parameters of where i had written before in occult america and and i have a particular insight on what i wrote in occult america because i just re-recorded the thing for random house and it's going to get re-released for halloween so it gave me this peculiar opportunity to revisit that book having just finished modern occultism first of all when i wrote occult america i was much more personally attached i think to the abrahamic r religious outlook and for whatever reason perhaps emotional reasons or just reasons of identification, I gravitated towards other figures who were, and I neglected figures like Anton LaVey and um, Jack Parsons, about whom I read extensively in this book, uh, Michael Aquino. I neglected organizations like uh, Process and Topi, about whom I read uh, much more extensively in this book. And 
I found it easy, I think, to uh, step around ceremonial magic because Crowley and Golden Dawn and maybe to a degree HB of L were, were European rooted and that wasn't precisely my focus. And in this and in teaching this course and then in later writing this book, I really tore the lid off of all that. And I challenged myself that if you're going to be real, you got to really dive into the deep end of the pool or I'm violating my own uh, dicta for life. And uh, so I threw myself into it for the course, and then I decided to make the course into a book. And as you probably are very aware, um, spoken word translates very poorly to the written page, and you can use it as the bare bones of a skeleton, but you have to go in and do much, much more work or you're bogus. And so I, I tell you, man, I threw myself into this project with a degree of intensity that I haven't experienced since I was writing my first two books, Cult America, One wow. Simple Idea. And I'm very, very happy about it. I'm very happy with the outcome. I'm very proud of it. I really, really stretched myself at every possible point. And I don't, the values that I espoused and the themes in which I was interested in, in a cult America, I wouldn't disavow any of that. All of that is still part of my existence, but I am different now. And my focal point is different and the people I want to defend are different and they deserve defending. I'm thinking of a figure like Aquino, for example, who seems to be the subject of a new uh, cult of hatred at the moment. Wait, again? Um, we may get into. <laughs> again? Uh, again they're doing this? It's like when yeah, it never it's stops. so pathetic considering how long he and his wife spent. Can you imagine the time, the money, the legal expense, the emotional agony of defending yourself from such morbid false accusations. And uh, so yeah. anyway, that aside, we may return to that. I am fueled by the passion of wanting to defend a person or idea who I think has been misserved. Process has been misserved. Topi has been misserved, as you know better than I, and so on and so forth. And so um, these became animating causes, but also exploring the idea of a guy named like uh, Eliphas Levi. I mean, Levi is such an interesting case because he was so critically important to the occult revival, and yet he was very attached himself to a Christian or Abrahamic worldview, and it colored his work deeply. It colored the Golden Dawn's work deeply. These divisions between white and black magic, I think, grew very tiresome, very didactic, very orthodox. They're ill-suited to our time culturally, but I also think they present very poor intellectual parameters. Anyway, all of well, this is I to want say, to dial down on that, actually, because that, that for me is super interesting, if you don't mind. I don't no, want to derail your flow, but I, I didn't want to leave that point. No, not at all. I'm just saying these are the animating passions that drove me into the book and through the book. So that's where it came from. Got it. Yeah, uh, Levy or Levi is... A fascinating character. His book is very good. Uh, yeah. It's completely over the top, like '30s Pulp yeah. Fiction. Uh, you know, like <laughs> right? e even back then, they they knew that like if they wrote about or had photographs of like naked witches, like everyone would show up. You know, like right. that, was, that was kind of like the writing style. Has Western culture changed? <laughs> Not much. Yeah. Right. So, um, but he is obviously such a. Uh, a critical turning point in the history of the occult and he's not written about a whole lot at all right. uh, and it's an interesting story to me because he was a defrocked catholic priest and um have you i don't know if you have you been to rome yes okay so so then you know it's 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 capital c catholic <laughs> like oh, yeah. so like it's like people doing this in france or or italy in the 19th century it's like uh, maybe it would be like maybe like Texas now, but with Catholics instead of evangelicals. I don't know, but um, you know. But then, then he kind of takes everything from the old and then prepares it for the Golden Dawn, and that's kind of like one of the critical points in the story of the whole thing. Like him, Agrippa, yes. and then Mathers, and then Crowley. But um, and you could argue Kenneth Anger, Anton Lavey, uh, although that's more recent. Um, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so these are critical 
um, you know, Genesis, uh, Chaos Magic. These are critical Parsons. There, there's a lot of critical flashpoints, but this is one of the most important because it lays the the groundwork for the Golden Dawn, which lays the groundwork for everything that comes after. Yes. So who what like? But who was he? I mean, did you get a sense of, of who he was? What his own person? You know, who he was as a person? What his personal story was? Because he kind of seems like just this character from like a Milo Minara comic book or something like that. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, just a the note to say, I very much agree with your analysis. As important and as seismic as Blavatsky was, she was almost like this, this, this demigod, you know, sent to Earth to just change everything. And she did. And as important as she was, she did not pursue ceremonial magic, especially after the departure to India and the dissatisfaction that some of her admirers felt with her to- almost total immersion into the Vedic system versus a Western esoteric or a revived Western, Western esoteric system created, I think, some of the discontent that generated the Golden Dawn, who did return so assiduously to, to Levi and then everything that came out of the Golden Dawn. And I agree, I mean, from Crowley to Genesis, absolutely. Um now, Levi is a very mysterious figure. In a way, I found him as mysterious as Madame Blavatsky, um, maybe even more so because his early life is 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 less well documented than hers. And um, and she um, I, I, she's been better documented than than Levi has. And Levi is almost one of these figures who only could have existed in the 19th century. I I really, truly don't think we could have an Eliphas Levi today because he lived in a more brutal era. And he lived in an era where if you declared yourself a socialist, it wasn't just some fun little thing that you did on Twitter with a hashtag and then go about your existence enjoying all the fruits of so-called late capitalism, uh, including Twitter X and all the doohickeys (laughs) that we love and wouldn't give up for the world. Um, so he lived in a very different era and he got on the wrong side of a government that was still uh, a sort of intention between uh, the monarchy that, that Napoleon Bonaparte had recreated and the Republic that was still very, very slowly being born. And he got on the wrong side of the government. He was jailed, probably spent a, a total of um, uh, at least 18 months in brutally unhealthy, shitty, uncomfortable conditions in Paris jails in the mid-19th century. Uh, Again, a level of sacrifice that so many of the big mouths on social media can't even fathom today. And he had already long since left the priesthood because I think he felt uh, absolutely uh, incapable of obeying the vows of celibacy. And he also, I think, just was, I think, chafed against uh, the notion that the church and 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 certain Vatican teachings were infallible. So the sexuality, um, the socialism, the early socialism, the uh, objections to doctrinal infallibility made him into a very heterodox, iconic figure, uh, a, a figure who struggled financially, a figure whose life was marked by unhappiness, his he he um lost his daughter at a very young age i believe she was at the age of 7 or so it's so inconceivable again for many of us today in the 21st century to cope with the brutality of 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 life as it existed then losing a child to a disease that's probably preventable today going to jail for beliefs that would probably be considered mildly conservative or centrist by today's you know online standards and you know casting about for where he's supposed to be in life and um and then finding a a profound interest in basically renaissance revival occultism that to a, a great extent was actually revived or inadvertently revived by napoleon bonaparte himself because right. napoleon, what you, that i don't know about what, what's the deal oh, with that well napoleon um napoleon uh, invaded egypt uh in 1799 and he brought with him in true napoleon style uh, an army of draftsmen archaeologists, 
uh, naturalists because he wanted to document the antiquities that he found. And some people think of Napoleon's invasion uh, as a big failure, and it certainly was a big failure insofar as he was repelled. I suppose it depends which side you're rooting for. (laughs) And if you're rooting for the Napoleonic armies, it was a big failure. Um, He he succeeded over the Mameluk um, chieftains in Egypt very, very quickly, but he was confronted by the British Navy, lost to the British Navy, and it caused a spiral of events where he had to withdraw. But the army of naturalists that he brought with him, draftsmen, um, archaeologists, they really created the field of Egyptology. They discovered what we now call the Rosetta Stone, unlocked at least the expository meanings of hieroglyphs. So Levi, as a uh, English, uh, as a Frenchman, um, still calling himself um, uh, Louis Alphonse Constant, uh, gets interested in Egyptology. Gets interested in this nascent field. Grows fascinated, as many Westerners do, with the so-called mysteries of Egypt begins to turn the pages backward, peel the onion back to Renaissance occultism, discovers Christian Kabbalah, which, by the way, is responsible for preserving Kabbalah to a very great extent. Um, okay, that, 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 that's be... a con- please say more about that, because that's a, controver- that's a controversial opinion on a controversial topic. It is, it is indeed, and it really needs to be shouted out. You know, the tree of life drawing with which we are now so familiar in the modern world, that emerged from the Christian Kabbalistic uh, tradition. Uh, The name of the particular artist is escaping me, but it's in the book. And Gershom Sholem, uh, a German-Israeli scholar who wrote um, uh, a a book on Jewish mysticism in 1946 that really gave rebirth uh, to Kabbalah as a field, he does fitfully credit, he does fitfully credit Hmm. Uh, Levi and Crowley for at least keeping the tradition uh, alive at a time when a lot of Jewish scholars just ignored it. For many, many years in the modern era, uh, Jewish scholars regarded Kabbalah as uh, the crazy aunt in the attic. It's like, yeah, well, you know, she's part of the family, but we kind of keep her up there and you got to be really careful with this material. It was neglected. It was considered a little far out, a little off track from uh, the necessary basics of uh, liturgy, Talmud, the various rabbinic writings. It was a stepchild, not a disavowed stepchild, but a stepchild. And the Christian Kabbalists did a great deal, uh, Johann Reuchlin and, and many, many others, did a great deal to preserve Kabbalah at a time when Jewish authorities were less explicitly interested in it. And Gershom Mm. Sholem himself, who was a conservative scholar, I mean, Sholem never identified with the school called the traditionalist, but he could have been associated with that, I suspect. Um, And Sholem was a very conservative, very assiduous scholar. He does shout out Levi and Crowley, albeit fitfully, for the, um, at least keeping a pilot light lit lit under Kabbalah while Jewish authorities neglected it. So, you know, people will like to run down uh, variants or adaptations of Kabbalah with a Q, and they have points sometimes, but they miss the big picture because this stuff was being almost universally neglected, but for the occultists. Anyway, so Levi got interested in this. He phoneticized his name into what he felt was a Hebrew-sounding name. He was philo-Semitic. Again, on occasion, there's a mistake made that Levi was somehow, I've had at least academics make the very poorly supported case that Levi was somehow anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. He was no such thing. He was a philo-Semite. Now, you could say that uh, uh, maybe some people feel uncomfortable with philo-Semitism because it's somehow idealizing or objectifying. Well, one could have that discussion, but it ain't the same thing as Mm anti-Semitism, and he certainly was not. So he phoneticizes his name to into what he believes would be its Hebrew variant, grows immersed in Christian Kabbalah, grows immersed in Egyptology as it existed then, grows immersed in the early occult reinterpretation of tarot, which had already been underway in France uh, uh, well over a generation before Levi through uh, Corte Jablin and um, some of his collaborators, uh, Comte de Melad, associating tarot spuriously 
with Kabbalah and yeah, ancient Egyptians. That Egyptian. turned out to be such a critical that's kind of his contribution to to the field. Yes. That turned out to be such a big deal. Like I just did this tarot course with Lon Duquette and he spends a lot of time talking about that and saying, look, it's really Levy that is responsible for the I mean, you could see the Golden Dawn system as Absolutely. what happened when you combine what happens when you combine the Kabbalah and Tarot, and I guess Egyptology, and then they put an Indian yeah. in as well. But That's it. primarily Kabbalah and Tarot and Tarot. So that so that was just spurious, but it turned out to be basically turned out to work. Yes, exactly. It's a it's a brilliant um mistake. It's a brilliant, brilliant mistake. And people get pissed off because they're so attached to it that they don't want to hear somebody come along and saying it's spurious. And the fact is, novelty and adaptation have brought a lot of important things to life in the modern world. In many respects, a lot of our religious traditions, both mainstream and esoteric, are novelty and adaptation. And records from antiquity were destroyed and we rely on late antiquity for a lot of stuff that we describe as ancient look the jewish liturgy itself it goes back to the middle ages that's pretty old but that's not antiquity yeah and you know we huh. get into this trip of like oh this is the stuff that came down from sinai and it's like no not exactly <laughs> that was a really fucking long time ago right. if it happened at all and we don't have you know we don't have those retentions you know we have late ancient retentions that we've remade mm. in modernity. There is no association between Levi's brilliant interpretation of tarot and Kabbalah. It is a it is a brilliant invention. And and yet I also recognize that uh sometimes it works. I recognize that it's meaningful to people. And um I recognize that religious traditions are rarely uh as old, pristine, or retentive as we like to pretend they are, and tarot is no different. Uh, Levi was brilliant, but there was a sort of sui generis quality to some of the things that he came up with. And one can accept that and still abide his brilliance, as I try to do in the book. And that was Elephus Levi. We know very little about the man beyond some of the broad strokes of his life. But I would hmm. say to people, at least look at his life, consider his life, what we know of it, because it did he did occupy a world that I would say was gone even by the time madame blavatsky came on the scene his was a world where you could get in a lot of trouble politically and judicially just for mouthing the wrong points of view still in the western world that's very interesting so you're kind of saying that once theosophy made a big splash on the scene it was not so much of a big deal it wasn't as dangerous as what levi was doing you could get branded uh a heathen and a lunatic and get called names and get thrown out of respectable places if you were a theosophist. But I mean, Levi served jail time. Uh, that was for his socialism. But hmm. um, but it, it, it does point out, and he stepped very carefully around religious authorities with his occultism. His occultism, heterodox as it was, still functioned according to Abrahamic Christian coordinates. You know, there's God above, there's the bad guy below, there's heaven above, there's hell below. He didn't he didn't violate those those coordinates, even though his system was really dramatically radical and new. Yeah, it's I mean, between that and the additions that Mathers made, that for me yeah. is that that's a big deal. And I know there's been such a push since Chaos Magic to discard Kabbalah. Uh, and my response is always, well, what do you have that is better? You know, right. you really like I, I unless you want to go full like Vedantic or Tibetan Buddhist or something like that. But people don't do that because then they would have to follow orders. <laughs> right, so, exactly. You know, and, <laughs> and, and that's no fun. Um, and there might be, you know, some of those orders might be um, involved renunciation of certain worldly things that none yeah. of us in the West want to give up. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, we yeah, we don't do that. No, we plan to. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a little tough for people. Yeah. Um, so, but, so do you think that with that said, that's all super interesting. Do you think it would be a valid, more or less valid academic point to make that Kabbalah, as we understand it, beginning with the Christian Kabbalah is simply just an outgrowth of the, you know, second millennium Western esoteric tradition. Like, it's not yeah. that it was being referenced back to, it also grew cotangently with the rest of that stuff. Is that kind yeah, of I think that's perfectly put. And, and I think, I think. 
certainly a number of the Christian Kabbalists early on would have acknowledged that. And later on in the 19th century, some started opting for alternate spellings or using the Q, which is a tacit acknowledgement of that. It harkens to an older tradition, which itself, again, we can't get ahead of ourselves as modern people, which itself emerges from late antiquity. I mean, this ain't going back necessarily to the tabernacle in the desert. You know, I mean, this is right. this this is late ancient stuff, um, somewhat in tandem with the rabbinical writings that started to emerge uh, after Rome uh, kicked out the residents of uh, of Judea. Uh, and they started casting around the world without a sort of ceremonial center any longer. And there you have Talmudic and Kabbalistic writings emerging. Um, it harkens to those writings for sure, but it is also is a, is a re- readaptation. And so if one delves into the Golden Dawn system or the Levi system or the Crowley system, I think there's genius there. But a person ought to know the historical lineage. Yeah, I agree with that. And... Um... Yeah, I've seen the point made multiple places by multiple people that, you know, and this is like from an this is an outsider academic perspective. This is like muggles, but they have seen multiple people make the um, the the point that you know Kabbalism, as as they call it, um, is completely coterminant with the rise of capitalism. Meaning, as as the alienation of the workers increases, yeah. um, or, you know, alienated labor goes up, then you have people looking for an outlet and escape, and that could be drugs, the occult, um, science fiction, you know, uh, uh, video games. And that kind of, the, but it's not just that, it's the idea that there's some other world that is not uh, colonized by the, the capitalist beast that is all around you. It's like, there's got to be, you know, and I think that plot is recapitulated in, you know, hero's journey movies, for instance, where the kid is offered the magic sword to get out of his mundane life, you know, in a a trailer park or something like that, or the last starfighter, something like this, where a kid is offered magic to go into the fairy world and has to come back and do the shaman's journey. But that kind of yearning for, well, there has to be some magic somewhere because it all seems to be gone from this world. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's a pretty, that's a pretty bitter reading of things. But I think mm-hmm. it it can I accept it as true at least on a certain level. That doesn't mean that I don't think magic is real. It's just that like, yeah, I can totally see that alienated labor would produce this flight into irrationality. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. A lot of people would, but yeah. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. It's also equally interesting to look in our more immediate world for occult expressions that have not been so fully commodified and sold back to us. I mean, every every one of us participates in the economy, period. I mean, there's virtually no one who's off the grid. But if you do look at uh, Process, uh, Topi, uh, Michael Aquino, to some degree Anton LaVey, uh, I'm sure there are some others I'm, I'm omitting, you do find streams of ideas that during the lifetime of the progenitors were not packaged and market, marketed back with any degree of ease. Uh, Aquino self-published all his own books. Uh, he tried pretty damn successfully to keep his death a secret. He didn't participate much in mainstream culture beyond his military career. And um, there's something to be said for that. You know, People ought to take a look at that because they're getting something that's unencumbered for the time being, by a barcode and repackaging. The barcode and repackaging is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, but it probably does evince subtle changes over time. Well, I think that, at least just in my experience, mainstreaming stuff is good for a lot of reasons, primarily one being that there's strength in numbers, and now people don't stick out as much as easy targets. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) That's the main one. That's the main one. Um, It's good that there is hashtag witch talk, and that every young woman in America thinks she's a witch. Great. I'm all for that. I mean, that's basically what I've been pushing for. Right. (laughs) Right. But but like, it's also there's a a level to it where it's just like, okay, great. Like, you know, no one's going to see me now. (laughs) But um, And it's also funny to watch how those terms, it's funny, the term witch will still arouse ire uh, in some parts of the culture, but obviously that's on the decline because it's just everywhere. And 
people will use the term witch as a term of mild heterodoxy, but it's not very dangerous anymore. Right. And it's interesting to see how some of those folk respond to terms that might still be unwelcome and what their response is. And usually it's it's somewhat similar to the response that they were greeted with, say, historically in the you know 1950s. Yeah, that is uh, a bitter irony that I have also yeah. noticed for sure. Yeah. It's like, uh, so, you know, my article on Anton, uh, not Anton, on Michael Aquino, I re- published a little excerpt of the book on Medium on Aquino, um, but that did not get curated. You know, he's still sort of by the mysterious editors behind the curtain at Medium. Um, and uh, if you get curated, your stuff gets some more eyes on it. You know, so, uh, so lots of they, they, there, but not a keynote. They hit that still, one. It's dirty. Yeah. Big they hit. They hit it. They hit the article. Well, they certainly didn't select it. You know, to go up in lights, um, okay. as others were. You know, in this uh, little informal series of clips that I've been publishing from the book. So. Levi's okay. Even Anton is okay. Okay. But Aquino is still a little too, uh, yeah. <laughs> too rough around the edges. <laughs> That's but, interesting. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, Don, what... Look at that, you know, because then you're getting something that hasn't passed through such and such filters at a certain point, and you can evaluate it. Right. Know? And that's very hard to find. And I think that um, that's one of the most beautiful things about the remaining kind of occult orders. Uh, if and I don't know, because I don't participate in any these days, but if mm-hmm. they're still functioning, I assume that some are... Um, uh, Don Webb lives here. Yeah, I, I, so I got to meet him. He did the podcast, and yeah, he definitely. It, from asking him, it definitely sounds like that whole witch hunting era was uh, no fun at all. But well, he's speaking of satanic panic back yeah, in eighties, nineties. Yeah, and I remember it as a kid because it yeah, affected it affected us as kids. Also, I mean, that's a whole other tangent to go on because it and it's sucks and sad, sad and boring, not boring but sad and shitty. But um. Yeah, there's a real val- like, you know, real value in truly occult things, meaning kind of hidden or hermetic, meaning kind of sealed off from the the withering gaze of the mainstream. And so yeah. um and in a way, my experience was that not only is it's not exactly that this actually was my now that I'm thinking about it, this was my conclusion. It's not that kind of the unique thing that is preserved within the occult world is not a an outsider movement to the western tradition it is the western tradition and i i think that the the temple of set is a good example of that where they're sitting around studying plato and socrates and aristotle you know and kant and all of this stuff and if you look back at all these groups that formulated western thought i mean even like pythagoras you know or or uh you know socrates it's like you know these people were essentially run operating mystery cults yeah. So it's the same yeah. thing back then. It's like all these religious writings, the Quran, the Bible, things like that. These came out of tiny groups of cognoscenti. So I think absolutely that, correct. So yeah, and Aquino's genius. It, you know, it seems to me, and I write about him quite a bit in the book because I, I think as a, a theoretician of the spiritual, there was a brilliance to the man. It's very difficult to subject parables or claims or ideas to any sort of empirical test, but that's true for every religion. Every religion, it seems to me, begins with one individual who either makes a miraculous claim or who or who contends that he or she has been the recipient of some um, greater communication. And then it's, of course, up to individuals to determine, is this so-called greater communication that you received, is it valuable? Is it persuasive? And what about the messenger? Does the messenger has have gravitas? Is the messenger compelling? So lots of people said that about, say, Joseph Smith. Check, check, yes. Mary Baker Eddy, check, check, yes. And these become new religious movements. I would say that about Aquino. I'm not part of the Temple of Set. Um, but, but I think that he made real original, uh, uh, he made efforts that were, I would say, unprecedented in modern Western life to reconnect with a satanic uh, tradition, a very, very deeply esoteric tradition that had not really expressed itself through movements so much as it had through the inspiration of certain individuals, including some of the romantics, Lord Byron, William Blake, to a degree, Milton, and um, 
And he, he sought to reconnect with that intellectually. And what he produced, I think, was just brilliant and just, just extraordinary. Um, and it hasn't been digested yet, which is why it's a special opportunity for people to, to check it out. You know, so, yeah. so he, he's someone who comes late in the book, but I spend a fair amount of time on for those reasons. And as we were alluding earlier in our conversation, there is this QAnon adjacent subculture online that is filled with umbrage and hatred for uh, Michael Aquino. And they are so profoundly confused. They're terribly dogged. Mm. Uh, they're very hardworking. They're boundlessly confident. And they're terribly confused. Uh, they That's have no really idea scary. what they're looking That's a at. scary combination. Uh, Ain't it? Yeah. yeah. Have you seen their... Sure what's, what's I'm that? sure there's nothing but happy endings in store for all of us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, what was that, mo what's that movie that just came out with, with the guy who played Jesus in it and Mel Gibson? It was like oh, this yeah. movie about... Do you know what I'm talking uh, about? The name escapes me. Yeah, yeah. like the Christian movie, the evangelical kids. movie about the missing kids. Yeah. yeah. Um, that... Well, they can hear him, you know, the character in that film. And... Uh, they're going back and they're lending very dogged and preferential readings to old lawsuits involving yeah. Aquino, of which there are many, because when he and his wife Lilith were defending themselves from these false charges of child abuse, for which they were not even present uh, in San Francisco at the time, they were living in Washington, D.C., which is why he was never charged. Um, and his house was searched. And I mean, the level of humiliation that he and Lilith had to go through, I can only guess at. But... Um, there were a lot of suits and countersuits because he was crisscrossing between civilian and military law. It was very complex. Yeah. And he pitched countersuits, a couple of which he was, some of which he failed at, some of which he was successful at. The whole thing is a goddamn mess. It's a terribly, terribly sad episode from the satanic panic. But all the episodes are sad because yeah. um, while there are God knows how many people getting abused within mainstream organizations, specifically Catholic Church, Boy Scouts, there's nobody getting abused at the, you know, McMartin daycare center. And yet you've got scores right. of people, counselors, working class people losing their lives, their livelihood, their, their sense of self, you know, because of these spurious charges. And yeah, I mean, it's such a tragedy. People committed suicide over false accusations and things like that in the eighties. And it's, it's just, um, you know, once this movie started taking off my line on it on Twitter was, it's like, you know, if these evangelicals really truly believe in stopping child abuse, then they should start with their own churches. Oh, for sure. Because if you look at the you just look at the data, it's like, oh yeah, kids are definitely getting abused in Christian churches and other religions too. But uh, it's pretty pretty damn prevalent within Christian churches. Every, I hope everyone could admit. Uh, yeah, there was just another one in Austin here. So you know, and it's not just Catholics; it's the it's the evangelicals as well. So it's like it's, it's for, for me, it's kind of like the old Bill Hicks joke, where it's like if you're really pro life. You know, don't join hands and block abortion clinics. Join hands and block cemeteries. Let's see how mm -hmm. committed you are to this this uh, this idea. So that's kind of my feeling about it. It's like it's just um, they're using it as a cultural battering ram. They're they want to make that association of people on the left and pedophiles, which is so unbelievably petty that it could work. And yep. um, that's very dangerous for everyone. You know, there was a pedophile, another pedophile insanity, and. England in the 90s and very famously uh the one of the mobs that was whipped up to a frenzy uh burned down the house of and killed a pediatrician because they saw the the phrase pediatrician on a sign and thought it was pedophile that he was what advertising was this is like 99 98 or 99 I think now, so, now I'll mention this um in the town of Poughkeepsie, New York, the Hudson Valley town, about 60 miles north of where I'm seated in New York City uh, in 2021, you may recall, um, an old historic Victorian home uh, where slept two members of the Church of Satan uh, was burned down by a homicidal arsonist who's at large. The, the guy was never caught. He was dressed in a hazmat suit. His face was disguised. He burned down the house using gasoline, you know, spread petrol around the house, burned it down. His image was caught in a security camera. There were two members of Church of Satan living in the house. That's why the house was targeted. It was known locally for being uh, a home, not really a group home, but a home that was habitated by Church of Satan members, um, of whom there's several, several in Poughkeepsie. And um, 
they escaped just with their lives, just with the, the clothes on their back. And this guy was never caught. And so when we're talking about this stuff, this is just 2021, 60 miles north of New York City. Uh, it's as real as it gets. It's as yeah. real as it gets. Yeah, particularly now. I mean, there's a mass shooting every day. There have been synagogue right. attacks on synagogues, things like this. It's right. Uh, right. Yeah, it's, it's pretty real. Um, and definitely, like, now that I live in Texas, it's like, yeah, like the kind of just mean-spirited evangelical close-minded fear yeah. you know just yeah. like this like oh, there's trans there's there's transgenders on my bud light now it's um it can be a bit much yeah fucking a the big issue that we all face not health care <laughs> yeah people are pissed about it out here they're making country songs about it uh so about the whole bud light thing yeah yeah wow um, that's heavy it struck a nerve uh so so yeah, it's it's um I mean I've been saying this on the podcast practically every show. It's like we can't take for granted this period of cultural this kind of a cultural golden age of outflowing of co collaboration and communication and podcasts and and accessible in YouTube, you know, it's never been possible before and cultural tolerance. It's like we can't take that for granted. That could go away quick. You know, I think COVID shows showed everyone how quick things can change. Mm. You know, it's funny. I rarely talk about this, but I'm just going to interject this and I'm not going to mention names because I'm just not down with that. Mm -hmm. But there was a new age organization that kicked me out because of my interest in Satanism. You know, some of the very things we've been talking about. Definitions be damned. You know, Horowitz is uh, consorting with the devil. So get rid of him. You aren't, aren't you, though? Yeah. I mean, huh? aren't, aren't you, though? I mean, technically, that's true, right? Technically, that's true. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but the definitions are very, very important. And uh, instead of coming to me and saying, gee, Mitch, what do you mean by all this? Which we could talk about. Uh, you know, they just defer to the definitions that are found in entertainment and um, conventional religion. Uh, but but in affirming yes to your to your question, it's just that they they can't locate what we're what we're discussing you know it's like kind of does socialism mean bernie sanders or does it mean pol pot right, well right. you can make the case for either but let's damn well get the ground rules down before we start debating the um the the good and bad points of it yeah um, depends so, on depends on if you've had your coffee in the morning which one it is right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so horowitz is out the door same organization um is named in a civil action suit because um under a uh, children uh, uh, now grown uh, claimed uh, sexual abuse at a summer camp that the organization runs. And it's like, well, for God's sake, instead of coming after some intellectual who lives in Brooklyn, who calls himself a Satanist, who doesn't bother anyone, or right. barely leaves his house, right. um, why aren't you taking care of the kids that are in your care? Well, you know, maybe that's less interesting. Well, maybe you think someone else should do that. Maybe it seems more exciting to, you know, send a fire and brimstone letter to Horowitz and get rid of him. But there are more uh, workaday things that you should be doing, uh, which 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 may seem uh, less uh, awarding of garlands at a given moment, but which are fundamentally ethically necessary to care for the kids that are under your tutelage. And it, 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 this story just repeats again and again. So I want to see people put their money where their mouth is. You know, if you say you care about this, that, or the other thing, start immediately, right away, and use as your mirror. Your relationships, yep. your relationships, you know, because it's easy for me to sing my own praises as a hero. But what does my partner think of me? What do my kids think of me? What do my coworkers think of me? Do I keep my word? Do I tell the truth? If I'm supposed to show up at 2 p.m. Eastern to talk with you, am I on time? You know, respecting your time, little things, perhaps. But they're a core sample of how a person lives. I'm tired of hearing people speak in, you know, abstractions. Hmm. When you say speaking abstractions, you mean just making well, you know, identifying themselves as dedicated, you know, to stopping human trafficking, for example. It's like, well, um, let's think about some ways that we can do that. And let's start with if you really care about the well-being of children, um, maybe there's something you could do in your immediate area to you know, make sure that children are are being signaled that we give a shit about you and we care about you. I don't know what that would be exactly. Um, if you have kids. I damn well hope that uh, you're 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 behaving in such a way that when they get older, they're going to look back and feel that somebody had their back. You know? Yeah. Uh, and if you don't have kids, um, do something else that's concrete and that's that's real, not just fucking repost 
you know, QAnon adjacent nonsense online and tell yourself that you're being a crusader. That's artificial. Right. I, I think it fulfills an ego need for people who feel yeah. powerless, you know, it's like, or yeah. maybe uneducated. And they're like, well, but I know the secret that you you can't handle. So right. therefore, you know, I'm in a sense, I have the power now because yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I only, I see the truth. And since it's yeah, a malevolent, you know, I don't mean to go off on a tangent about it. It's just, I look at like Damien Eccles and he is still trying to get a, a, a proper DNA yep. hearing, you know, to fully exonerate him from the crimes for which he was on death row. Completely fucking false, completely fucking invented. And he and his compatriots, they lost a part of their lives that can never be given back. And he's still fighting. He's still yeah. fighting yeah. to get the DNA evidence heard. Um, let's dwell in reality here. You know, let's dwell in reality. And people who are promulgating all this stuff, to me, um, there's a lot of vanity, a lot of fantasy. Um, sometimes they're thorough, you know, as hell, but they're thorough in a very disjointed preferential way. Uh, thorough enough to think that they're doing the research, you know, as right. the favorite expression goes, but right. crowdsourcing preferential reading and rock throwing ain't research in my book. And again, you know, start with the boring stuff, start with the boring stuff. Where's the individual's relationships, which is the only mirror of who we really are. Yeah, I like that. Um, I had a lot of thoughts about that, but I think just focusing on that last bit that you said is really important um, because that's very easy to overlook. And I think people, yeah. uh, you know, I've certainly found in my own experience, just getting older, it's like as time goes on, it's a lot. I, I maybe, maybe, maybe not. You feel the same way, but I just find it very, very hard to rail against the external world these days uh, I as, as bad as it has been for the last few years because it's just like well okay yes but also you know you get to a certain point in your life where you confront you have to confront your own failings and yeah. it's just like okay well yeah but you know what like there's a lot of shit that i've i've not done right in my life so like I, like I just don't have like the bandwidth to crusade or have, be on a moral high be on a moral high horse against the world. And I used to really badly. So, um, but I think you get to a point where hopefully you just kind of see it's like, well, you know, like things aren't great in some ways, but everyone's just trying, everyone's just trying to do their best in this, this, uh, sublunary world. I, I, I really feel that. And, um, I know it's not what people want to hear because it sounds so mundane, but I do think that one's immediate relationships and obligations are really the only expression of life that's actual. I mean, you can vote however you want. You can put whatever posters up on your wall you want. Um, you can say that you're, you know, uh, you're an Ayn Rand person, or you can say you're a Che Guevara person or whatever the fuck you want to do. But it, it's, it's just, it's just a choice of, of sprinkles. You know, it's it's damn near meaningless. Yeah. We have to be involved with the mundane, hardcore issues of our lives. At this point in my life, I have very few relationships. I mean, I have my partner, I have my kids, I have very few friends, but I, I try to like keep those relationships small, compact, but 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 real, you know, to the best sense that I'm able. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, for me also, it's just, it's, I, 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 I do truly feel that like your closest relationships are kind of what you'll be judged by also, not necessarily what the world sees. So yeah, yeah. yeah that can be both wonderful and very painful uh, at times. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually inspired in, in this by uh, Bill Wilson, you know, the, one of the co-founders of AA 12 Steps. Bill is in the new book and Bill was a pretty fucking wild guy. I really would have liked to have known him. He really, Bill was a true experimenter and he was so dedicated to trying to push the margins of finding how spirituality could be applied in ways that would help the individual, that there was nowhere he wasn't willing to look. And Bill said, you know, if you want to know you're changing, look to the people around you because you'll deceive yourself. You'll deceive yourself, but they won't deceive you. Hmm. And I thought that was cool. Yeah. Tough, but tough, but real, I think. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Um, yeah, just on a tangential point as well, uh, we were talking about theosophy and then kind of went into QAnon and that made me make a connection in, in my mind. It's like, you can kind of lay the blame at the doorstep of theosophy for kind of festooning upon us these huge grand master spiritual narratives. I mean, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not. It's also in the, every other religion, but 
but there was this kind of, you know, ori orientalism plus kind of conspirituality. It's like, basically what I'm trying to say is the same vibe you get from reading those old Blavatsky books is the same vibe you get from reading these kind of conspiratorial tirades on the internet or David Icke or something like that. People who are painting this grand, you know, black and white spiritual narrative of just like Blavatsky did. It's like, you know, Blav Blavatsky was also very hung up on the black hat magicians and white hat magicians. And like, there's this battle of good and evil. And it's like, yeah. no, not really. But um, right, right. anyway, so. Well, I have so much affection for Madame Blavatsky that I'm, uh, I give her, uh, I, I just, I feel so much affection for her as a figure that it probably makes me slightly prejudiced, okay. but in her favor. Um, but I'll say this. I don't know if, um, I don't know if truth is a defense of, uh, uh, slander. I uh, must have overslept that day in law school, but um, I, uh, I would say that with HPB, the one <laughs> since you know this is ultra culture. I mean, we're allowed to go every place, right? Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> if it's true, of course, you know she gets a pass. You know she gets an off ramp. You know if Master Moria didn't materialize to Henry Olcott one night on the west side of Manhattan, not too far from here then Madame Blavatsky gets passed. You know, I know, I realize that's a little bit like saying, well, if Noah's Ark is true, Jason, then the evangelicals get a pass. Right. Um, but it, it is true. Uh, it yeah. is true. Okay. And dinosaurs are um, false. They're put there by the devil to test your faith. Dinosaur bones. Dig. dig. Um, <laughs> so many remarkable things occurred in the life of Madame Blavatsky and Henry Olcott. They and, and she died at just age 59. I mean, she really wasn't even fucking around very long. And the things that she did and that he did are so extraordinary that, you know, I say this in the book, look, I am not prepared to defend Henry's account that Master Moria materialized in front of him one night in his bedroom over on the west side of Manhattan. Um, and yet, and yet, I must take a pause because they were not in the best of health. She was morbidly obese. He walked with a gouty leg. Uh, and they uprooted themselves from the reasonable comforts of Victorian era New York, if you had money, uh, relocated to India and just changed the world. And her her fingerprints just show up everywhere, even in the revival of witchcraft, places where I didn't expect her fingerprints to show up. They show up. There was something about these people that was not ordinary. I can't say what it was, but there was something about them that was not ordinary. Whereas, for example, I look at a guy named David Icke. And although he's a hell of a good extemporaneous speaker, I find him profoundly ordinary in mm -hmm. the sense that all Ike has figured out to do um, is to take Gnostic language and apply it in ways that gives a beard to um, just old-fashioned European bigotries. Yeah. And, and it all fits together very neatly, and it works really well. And that's part of the Abrahamic tradition, too, the good versus evil, the ultimate showdown, the bad guys over here and the good guys over here. And I'm always the good guys. It's a Gnostic theme. It's a Gnostic narrative. I have greater generosity for it at its inception points. In terms of modernity, one of those inception points was Madame Blavatsky and Olcott, who did it lead remarkable lives. Yeah, that's, I think, something that has made everyone very uncomfortable for the last few years is the kind of, I think it's become very obvious that when you kind of get on the conspiratorial track, if that gets pushed far enough in a non-ideal situation where people are experiencing economic distress or something like that, then pretty soon it becomes yeah. targeting groups of people. Without uh, question. Yeah. You know? I mean, how did the Church of Satan House get burned down in Poughkeepsie? You know, I mean, the guy who did that, of course... Is is absolutely convinced wherever this homicidal asshole may be that uh, he's on the side of the angels. You know, I'm sure he has no no not a moment's doubt of that. Right, and then yet yeah, you always meet like the, the so-called evil satanic people, and they're just like really soft-spoken book bookworms. You know, just right. <laughs> right? it's like it's total evil, the face of total evil. Um, Duncan Trussell was saying to me the other day, like you know, he's like, I know all these people who are into Satan; they are the nicest people. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I don't know why that is. <laughs> yeah, people have observed that about about uh, horror writers also. Like they're very nice because they get they get all the they delve into the darkness all day long and they just get it out they don't have any leftover for their interactions with other people so oh, i always thought that was interesting because like you know real darkness is just like you know yeah. people doing the wrong thing in reality so well you know i've said this to people and they think i'm being glib but i'm really not being glib like real darkness is 
a a a a a workspace um an open air open source workspace at a health insurance company somewhere <laughs> with a cubicle with pictures of kids up in it and the rainbow that the kid drew at school and somebody's on the phone uh, or going through you know files denying health coverage yeah. that somebody has paid for and as a matter of policy and none of us can do anything about it because we're all upset about Bud Light or whatever the fuck, right. you know, and it could be fixed. That to me is evil, you know? Yeah, it's also just the level of superstition is, you know, it's like, yeah, you could be upset about that, but you're upset that somebody turned a geomantic figure upside down. It's right, like, heaven it, forbid. It's just a drawing, bro. You know, it's like... <laughs> um, but your health insurance claim, well, you know, that's forgettable, you know, or whatever right uh, somehow that doesn't get politicized in the same way well maybe to dial it take it take it back to more romantic times um uh, talk about agrippa because agrippa is fascinating to me uh, for a lot of reasons and doesn't get doesn't get fair shift at all i don't think so what what uh, you dug into him for this book so that I'm, i'm interested in your take well agrippa waited um close to 30 years to see his three volumes of cult philosophy published. You know, I mean, uh, we talk about the occult experimentation of the Renaissance, and it certainly was there, but boy, you know, it wasn't North Adams, Massachusetts. I mean, you really had to step very, very carefully around ecclesiastical authorities, so it could be the end of you. So Agrippa got the imprimatur of, um, um, the name is escaping me, but it was a Catholic bishop. Maybe it was Reuchlin who was interested in Christian Kabbalah. Um, he framed things in a very Abrahamic, Judeo-Christian fashion. Um, he bookended his uh, insights and his curation um, with a nod to the church and the forces of Christian good. And he waited a very, very, very long time until this material could be published uh, in Latin um wasn't translated into english until over a century later uh so the man really worked as just a a tremendously dedicated dedicated uh, curator gatherer pedant and i don't think very few people in contemporary life could fathom what it would look like to spend close to 30 years waiting for your work to be published so that you could hit it politically just at that right moment, especially when a lifetime was probably on average, you know, 50 or 60 percent of what our lifetime expectancy is today. So he really was quite extraordinary. It's difficult to enter Agrippa. It's difficult to enter John D. you know, as you know. I mean, these guys, um, even though D came much later, they they the level of rigor and effort that they put into their labor and their curation and their magical ceremonies um i don't know that that the psyches of 21st century people with few rare exceptions there are some exceptions are capable of this today the gratification is 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 so deterred and delayed and the effort so fine and so so careful i think those guys belong more to antiquity than they do to modernity in the sense that uh, the pace of life was just so different for them and i'm in awe of it i'm in awe of it it's not a pace of which i'm capable that's interesting i mean i look at people like uh, d and um i suppose agrippa although i don't know much about him personally but uh and you could say people like Crowley, Mathers, uh, maybe yeah. Levy as well. Certainly D. It's like I look at guys like that and I think, okay, who would that guy be um, in the modern world? And he would probably be like a systems administrator, like IT guy with a with a ponytail and a big science fiction collection um, mm-hmm. who's really good at what he does. And um, I think, you know, that's what I get when I look at like the Enochian records and things like that. It's just this just looks like computer code to me or maybe it looks like how somebody whose brain works like that, you know, who's, who is studied in physics, optics, chemistry, all this stuff. It's somebody who has that type of brain. How would they approach magic? I mean, they probably wouldn't approach it by, you know, writing poetry, which is what Crowley did, or painting, which is what Spare did. If they're an engineer, it's going to come out like that, I think. Um, and so I, I don't know if there isn't a place in the modern world for people like John D. I mean, I think that definitely there's delayed gratification, but this is a time of so much mass interest in magic. 
Um, and I think it is frustrating for me sometimes to see people staying very surface level, but also not because going past surface level requires so much personal sacrifice. Um, right? I, I don't think that I, I don't think that most people are prepared to or should make that sacrifice. Uh, and, yes. Unless for some reason it's your kind of what you're supposed to be doing, um, but uh, that's kind of my feeling on it. That is an incredible point, and I think that's a very good point. That level of sacrifice, that level of meticulousness, it may not belong to our era in in a certain sense. I there is one personal acquaintance I have, and I'm not going to mention his name only because he's practicing mainstream law. And I don't know that his clients want to know that, oh, you're a magician. Um, but he, uh, a scholar of uh, Latin, you know, how many people do you know who still study Latin? I mean, really just such an effort, such a tremendous effort. And uh, as he was uh, preparing to go to law school, shortly before he went to law school, he got volumes of Dee's original notebooks and he reworked some of Dee's uh, uh, spells and did them uh, with meticulousness and care, dedicating just vast, vast amounts of hours to this. And um, it's an ongoing conversation with him, how it all uh, worked out. Uh, did it produce fruits? Um but I think he was glad he did it. And uh, artistically and intellectually, what he brought to it was just um, just extraordinary. The level of meticulousness, not coding, not binary code, but a recreation of the D-Magic. Mm -hmm. And again, um, my hat is off to him in so many ways because I, I couldn't do it. My journey right now, my approach has a lot in common with what Jack Parsons expressed an interest in shortly before his death, which was simplicity. You know, Jack was yeah. asking himself, can we wind this down to its simplest basics? And I'm very interested in that. And I hope I have good reasons for being interested in that. I hope my reasons for that are intellectually integral and not just impatience um, retrofitted to some sort of intellectual uh, journey. But I, I do feel very, very deeply interested right now in the question of uh, accelerance, uh, brevity, uh, simplicity. It's partly why I'm so interested in parapsychology and ESP research, because I think that if you can demonstrate in myriad ways, one of which may be scientific and statistical, that the mind, the psyche, possesses extra physical capacities, that may abet um, simplicity. That may help us if a person is interested in unraveling some of the liturgy, ceremony, ritual, which I grew up with, albeit in a different tradition. And by the time I was in my early 30s, I wanted to move away from it. And I've never lost that. Um, and in, in experiences where I've gone back into areas where the ceremonial, the religious, the liturgical is very thick, whether occult or mainstream, historic, it's not for me. I want to get away from it. And I don't know whether that's because I'm a product of my times or something else, but whatever it is, I'm very sympathetic to what Jack was aiming for and what was tragically cut short at the end of his life. Yeah, I kind of came to the same conclusion on Jack Parsons. I mean, I spent 20 years on Anukian. Um, mm -hmm. and wow, that's a hell of a commitment. Well, if you could, if you that's not 24 seven. I mean, that's the ramp up that's doing the magic that's going back and doing the magic more uh, Still. ornately. And then it's writing the book. So, um, <clears throat> but anyways, I think that having gone through that and read everything and kind of parsed and analyzed everything that D had written and everything that Crowley would ri had written and then everything that Parsons wrote, I think he did simplify it down to its core. Um, okay. and I think that the core is Babylon and Jack was very on point about that. And we say his life was tragically cut short, but I think he said what he needed to say. Um, yeah, I think Jack is a success, actually. I'm sorry he died as young as he did, because I would have liked to have seen what came next. And I don't want to see a person go through undue physical pain. But I do view his life as a success. Yeah. And I think we're still catching up with him. Uh, I we're still catching up with the Book of the Law. Um, and even the, even the book of the law says basically throw out the old stuff. Um, I was talking to Carl and Vanessa a couple weeks ago and Carl was saying, yeah, I have no 
connection whatsoever to the old ceremonial way of doing things. And Carl was in the OTO for and took it very seriously, as far as I know, for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I it, admire that. It's like, I want to get to that. Um, on the other hand, it's like, I was always head down in the Kabbalah the entire time of even like, even when I was doing full on chaos magic, it was always Kabbalah and everyone around me was just like, why? Like all the chaos magic people were like, you don't need to do that. Jen was baffled by it, you know? And, uh, for me, it's like, well, but this is, this is kind of the Western magical tradition. I mean, I understand you want to break the rules, but you kind of got to do it the way that it's been done at yeah. least, at least to understand it. And I don't have it like this antipathy to Kabbalah that, that people have for some reason. I mean, it's like hardwired into my brain. So, um, mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm with Crowley when he says that it, at, in the long run, it makes your life simpler. Uh, people get put off by the complexity, but I think that's true. Um, Richard Smalley spent a long time, um, studying Kabbalah. I don't know if he's been on your show or you've been in touch with him recently. Who is, I don't, who is that? Richard is was one of the co-founders, co-editors of Gnosis Magazine, and he edits Quest Magazine for Theosophical Society. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant scholar of esotericism. And, um, and mature enough at this point in his journey so that he doesn't... Um, he doesn't need to get into pissing matches with anybody, you know, and it's very easy to discuss ideas with Richard. Uh, Richard wrote a book called, um, uh, well, he's written several uh, books, um, but um, one of them was um, uh, Hidden Christianity. He's written on the Gnostic tradition, uh, and he's brilliant, and he's been a big inspiration on me, especially, um, well, through all his material, but his early Gnosis essays were hugely inspiring to me and i read all his stuff anyway he studied kabbalah for a long time and i think you and he could have an interesting discussion that would be great yeah i will yeah. Uh, i will take and take a note of that yeah so agrippa i've always been meaning to look further into that because that used to be like the book of magic that everyone in europe was using and it's the one that d yeah. was d was using and and started with but then they moved on from that to what was transmitted in the Enochian sessions, which for me is kind of the main, the main event, the main show. Yes. Uh, but yeah, the Agrippa was the starting point for everyone at that time. And also like, I think he gave up magic at like 25 and maybe uh -huh. that book wasn't published till 30 years after that, but he gave up no. and, and uh, considered it a mistake that he'd ever done it. Yeah. It's interesting. You find that among several of the Renaissance figures and it's difficult to tell whether their recantations are sincere or whether they're just kind of politically covering themselves because it could still be very dangerous and you could lose your, uh, your Royal appointment or your pension or your teaching position. And then what are you supposed to do? You know, take in laundry. Um, right. It's, it's, you can just walk around your resume, you know, through uh, wherever it is you, you know, happen to live, you know, in, uh, um, you know, some some stretch of the the Western or Central Europe. So the recantations may be sincere, they may be political. It's hard to know. They might be both also, just because yeah. social pressure is real and, and people may have gotten to the point where they'd just gotten the shit end of the stick for so long that they really were sorry. They just wanted, yeah. wanted yeah. To, this to stop. And a lot of the Renaissance occultists, of course, they were either clerics or they had church adjacent positions. I mean, the church and the monarchy controlled almost all of life. There was a uh, very little uh, developed economy outside of cathedrals, monarchy, church. I mean, sure, there was trade and there was a reopening of trade routes. Um, but beyond that, there wasn't too much economic development. And you had to, you had to stay on the right side of the powers. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think of this stuff going back, going back to the more ceremonial formulations of things after new thought and what, what was, oh. what, what insights did that kind of spark comparing those two similar, but different things? Well, I have a deep love for new thought and I criticize new thought quite a bit, but it's an area of absolute commitment for me. Um, I dedicate a chapter in the book to the development of new thought. Um, the reason I like new thought is because it is the ultimate um, do it yourself effort at 
the externalization of will. Uh, if if we abide Crowley's definition, and I don't think we have a better one, as magic of the, I'm paraphrasing, of course, magic of, as the art and science of um, of the externalization and concretization of will. Uh, what else is new thought, albeit very frequently dressed up in very, very uh, heavily based New Testament language, um, sometimes to the point where I find it almost uh, off-putting, but New Thought, from its inception on forward, is an attempt to harness the powers of the psyche without any intermediary, as simple as as, as possible. And it is the ultimate reformation of occultism in trying to boil down the simplest traits of the philosophy. The difficulty with New Thought is we human beings are absolutely uh, virtuistic at recreating orthodoxies everywhere. So within New Thought, the orthodoxies are that you have to pray in a certain way, you have to make assumptions in a certain way, and that it always works. And if it doesn't work, you made a mistake, and you have to go back, and you have to do the prayer, the visualization, the affirmation, the ritual differently. And I reject that, because I find that if a philosophy, a therapy, uh, a magic doesn't work, it becomes insufficient to tell the practitioner, well, you, you just didn't do it right. I mean, that right. just becomes a form of uh, a catechism. There's a deadness in that where, okay, great. We fled religion only to completely recreate religion and be told that there's only, you know, three buttons on this elevator and you can press one of them. And if they don't take you to the floor you want, just keep pressing them. Uh, that's <laughs> insufficient. That's insufficient. So like in my book, Daydream Believer, I tried to share as best as possible my experiments in new thought, successes and failures, and to analyze the failures. And the best analysis I can come to, quite frankly, is that we live, we dwell uh, under uh, dynamic laws and forces, of which I believe the law of thought causation uh, is one, but it can no more be said to be liberated from surrounding circumstance than the law of gravity is liberated from surrounding circumstance. Gravity responds to mass. It's going to be very different experience at different time and places, including, for that matter, in 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 conditions of great speed or velocity, like being on a uh, a, a fighter plane or being on a roller coaster or wherever. Um, people can relate to these examples. Why should a law of mind causation as a natural law, if it is one, be any different from that? So it's very complicated. And I find that hermeticism actually brings um, a salve, a solution, because within hermeticism, thematically, you find very explicit statements of the, the mind, the psyche, the imagination being capable of scaling heights, uh, surpassing natural laws. But you also find reminders that the individual is going to perish, that these forms that we live in will decay. But perhaps, perhaps the most hermetic of all the Psalms is, um, ye are as gods, but ye shall die as princes. That's the human situation. We have these, these powers that can justly be called magical. They're incredible. You test for them in a lab, we might call it psi or ESP or telepathy or uh, precognition or psychokinesis or what have you. They're actual, they're real in my estimation, um, but they're very heavily conditioned by surrounding circumstances. And humanity is in a tough spot, a very tough spot. We dwell under many laws and forces. If there are other spheres of existence, uh, perhaps, perhaps beings in those other spheres of existence, perhaps live under fewer laws and forces, but we live under a hell of a lot. So I'm trying to marry that to new thought because that in my estimation, is what keeps New Thought from entering a phase of maturation. And it's tough because part of the appeal of New Thought is that we live under this one mental super law or, or law of attraction and that we can manifest. And I avoid those phrases because there's they don't do enough to acknowledge the complexity that we live under. And I'm really trying. I mean, I give it my best. I stretch my muscles as much as possible in Daydream Believer to, to wed these elements. My conviction that there is truth in the thought causation thesis and, and that there's also truth that um, it's not a one-way road that works simply if you mm -hmm. just abide the road signs. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, maybe it's just this part of being human, that is not true. There's so many switchbacks and twists and turns along the way. Yeah. And if you bump into a rock, 
you will experience pain. And I think it's important to stress that that's normal because people get really down on themselves when things don't work. Totally. Um, that's really interesting. I was thinking as you were saying that, that maybe the issue there is that kind of super law approach as you were pointing it out. Because all, all this stuff kind of got marketed in the 20s and 30s and magic still is as kind of a master key, like the secret, the yeah. master key to life. Right. Right. And I think that kind of extrapolating from what you were saying, just pitching it, you know, not over promising that to that kind of like carny level, but just saying, you know, this is, you know, mind, the influence of mind on your environment is one of many forces, but don't you think your life would be better if you had a handle on that one than versus if you didn't. And I think that who, who can argue with that? And so I think that putting magic is just that mastering that part of life. That's honest. And I think that honesty counts for a lot with people. Yeah. yeah. Even if it's a weird idea, if they can tell you're being honest, then people can tell that. I think that's perfectly framed. That is perfectly framed. And Anton LaVey was part of that conversation as well. You know, Anton made the observation that the kind of magic that you want to practice, apropos of what you were just describing, it should have a certain context within your life. You need to go through established channels. You need to go through channels that perhaps you know uh, you've already blazed certain trails. If you're if you're if you're trying to achieve something that's completely out of context to your life, like I'd like to be an astronaut. Well, I might want that very badly, but that is so outside of the coordinates of my life that it's questionable whether anything will precisely get me there. And so Anton would encourage people to go through the established channels of their existence because that's the great likelihood of how you're going to get to something great, whatever it may be. Magic abets, it does not create. I think he would have agreed with that statement. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. And sometimes magic uh, takes you off course too. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes you can rationalize that as being what needed to happen. And sometimes it's just very frustrating. Um, like Kenneth Grant called that tangential tantrums. The magic ricochet is wrong. Um, but I think that general point of um, saying it's one of many forces, but you had very, when I think all, all these, a lot of these ancient cultures had an understanding of this. I mean, obviously India, any culture where meditation is practiced heavily, there's just an implicit understanding that if you yeah. let go of the reins on your mind, it's going to run roughshod over everything. So... Yeah you might want to kind of keep that under wraps. And I think yeah. that, uh, and, and harness it and get, use it as the vehicle that it's supposed to be to get you where you're going to go rather than letting the car drive you. I'm mixing metaphors now, but hopefully that's, that comes across. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. And I, I, um, I think that, um, finding ways to properly contextualize magic is a big part of our generation's uh, task because we've seen too much, and experience too much to accept um, the kind of like, you know, the magic wand offering. And I think we need to contextualize magic with everything else we've seen and we understood, including geopolitical events. Mm -hmm. um, you know, new thought for a particular reason grew among the American middle class. I mean, that, that you know, I don't think it's as popular in Haiti right now. You know, right. I mean, people there are dealing with such terrible, terrible stressors of life. Um, I don't, I don't think that 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 new thought, although it might offer something to someone's life as an individual, it, 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 you know, culturally, it's just not going to be igniting of um, of 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 acceptance as it was in the early United States, where money could could seem to come out of the ether, you know, through the stock market or what have you. I mean, culturally, we have to understand the conditions under which new thought developed and which fed into its persuasiveness. Yeah, I agree. And I also would say that I'm not necessarily sure about people in 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 bad situations. You know, I've met lots of people from the so-called, you know, developing world who are mm -hmm. in really, really dire situations, but they're clinging to like the one new thought or Tony Robbins book that they found. And they're convinced that, right, that that's right, going right. to get them out of it. And sometimes it does a good example. Yeah, sometimes it works. A good example yeah. is Pitbull who, you know, what, however you feel about Pitbull, uh, uh -huh. was like ultra into Tony Robbins in Cuba and was doing all those mind exercises to get to the U S and, uh, 
you know, and it worked and Pitbull got to the US. And like I saw him perform. I know this is very uncool. I do, I do not get any occult what? points for this. <laughs> Pitbull. This is just like I'm in the dad mode phase of my life. I don't care anymore. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he said at that concert, it's like, you know, if you're if you're in America, like like shut the shut the F up in so many words. It's like you have all the possible opportunities you can imagine yeah, here. Yeah. So. That's the thing, you know, people talk about like um, gratitude being this milk toast philosophy. And it's like, to me, it's just like fucking reality. I mean, in our country, um, I'm sure there's people watching who are not necessarily here in North America, but in North America, you can goddamn turn on a faucet and have water come out that the better likelihood than not is healthy to drink, flick the lights on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, to not have a modicum of gratefulness is to be either a real prick or to just be unrealistic so um I or, have to or just really or just really young and yeah really really contrast. young yeah and, you know, uh <laughs> yeah it's, i'm all, and yet people are still looking for miracles you know it's just like you have hot running water that's hot running water <laughs> like, imagine <what? laughs> that right 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 but i, I think and we have these funny little, uh, you know, binary codes that can allow us to talk to one another in real time across a continent. Right. <laughs> no, literally, it's like I always say this. It's if you go back and you look at any of these grimoires, all the magical powers that are promised in there have already been given to us by technology. And for yeah. me, for me, magic is not trying to long for something that is not. It's trying to or or looking for miracles. Rather, it's trying to cope with a world of miracles, which we now live in because of technology. Um, and if I just may add a, a brief adjunct to that, Gurdjieff mm -hmm. used to say to his students that when a person looks at a chair or some household object, he or she should really know something about where that chair comes from. Know, you know, what's it made of? You know, wood, um, rivet, steel, uh, varnishing, you know, who, who made that? Where did it come from? You know, I mean, this nail polish was made in a factory somewhere where somebody was breathing in really fucking shitty fumes. And mm -hmm. I'm guessing it wasn't in Greenwich, Connecticut. And I'm guessing it wasn't in my nice neighborhood here in Brooklyn. You know, somebody went through some shit, you know, to make this. And it's just like one little item that I toss across my shelf. Yeah. Yeah. Be aware. It's the best extent possible. Yeah. I definitely get this image of people in the, people just you know moping that existence is horrible while they're being held up by row after row just the backs of, of uh poor people um yeah. so but i really like your point about a generational thing trying to be to contextualize magic and i agree with that. i mean i've been i feel like i've been meditating on that question my entire life um and uh I think it's important to do that without throwing away the magic, no pun intended or pun intended, yeah. I mean, without disenchanting it, which is hard to, hard to do. But I think that that point, like I have a few like end all be all definitions of magic and I change them all the time. But um, one would be that another would be techniques for getting into your parasympathetic nervous system just flat out. I mean, just getting your body into relaxation mode. And that would be yoga, meditation, breath work. Mm -hmm. uh, mantras chanting pick your pick your poison yeah um so those are two but also it's the it's, it's the ability for somebody to construct the story for their life that they want mm -hmm. so it's like mm -hmm. a writing it is a writing process in, mm -hmm. in that sense um but I'm, I think of, I'm, my mind goes to, it's again, no pun intended, the whole idea of if you come across the mind stream in Tibetan Buddhism. No. Oh, oh, you'll love this. So the mind stream is literally just that. It's all of your thoughts throughout your life that you're kind of, I guess, I, I visualize it as like my brain moving along kind of like a monorail track of all the thoughts I'm going to think in my life. And for the Tibetans, <clears throat> your mind stream is the manifestation of your karma. And so whenever you, whatever mental state you've cultivated at the time of death will um, uh, lead to your next rebirth. Because for it's in their way of thinking, let's say you go out in a state of hatred, as a lot of people do, you know, I, I got, I got, I didn't get my time or whatever it is. And um, well, in the Tibetan way of thinking, okay, well, then you go through the bardo, which is kind of a psychedelic trip where you get to the a chance to, to disassociate from um, thinking any of this is real. But if that doesn't go well, then essentially the vibration of your mind will be attracted to parents with the same vib mental vibration. 
So if you die in a state of hate, you're likely to be born in a hell-like situation. Like right. in, in, so I find absolutely no reason to doubt that. I don't Based either. On verification, I find no reason to doubt that. I looked at the family that my mother came from, the family that my father came from, and the degree of familiarity is so extraordinary as to be almost uncanny. And of course, one could come up with materialist justifications for that, none of which, none of which disabuse us of the notion that what you described is absolutely true, that there are these unseen tendrils of connection, which, you know, the materialist culture never wants to deal with, even though the evidence for that not only across human testimony and experience, but across the sciences, it's just building and building and building mm -hmm. to the point where materialism has almost become a position of sentiment. And I find what you just described, whether it could be described as, um, you know, maybe there's a, a term here and there that's metaphorical, it doesn't matter. I think the schema that you just described is incredibly convincing. Yeah, I'm very convinced by a lot of Tibetan ideas, and they're so worked out logically that it's very hard to disagree. You know, like, I don't think anyone could disagree with that just as a useful belief to have for mental belief, health. Right. And, right. Who, yeah. who would describe karma? And there are many different iterations of it, and we have our own pop version here in America. But regardless, who would describe that as other than a belief that matches... Uh, that, 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 that has utility, that matches the needs of the individual? Hmm. I happen to think it's true, but truth also has a strange way of being useful. Yes. Yeah. And, and vice versa. Um, yeah. yeah, for me, that's what it's all about, the kind of the mind stream. And I, I think that techniques like ritual magic or obviously something like sigils or or um, new thought processes and things like that are kind of ways to breach that stream and try to kind of like throw or maybe throw a rock in that you hope will change the course of the stream. But I think in their way of thinking, you know, a hardcore meditation practice uh or, you know, initiation within Vajrayana Buddhism or whatever, you know, a hardcore, a hardcore meditation practice under lineage gurus um, is the way to purify the stream totally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think that that for me has been, th that's the name of the game for me, even to be able to just control. It's always been, magic for me has always been a game of, can I control my own mind uh, with mm -hmm. meditation and things like that. And that's my benchmark as to whether I'm on point in life or not. So with that kind of in mind, I was thinking one thing I wanted to ask you before um, you, when you agreed to the interview, was just if you have this idea of mind stream, people's mind streams have been shit since COVID. And mm -hmm. uh, I think probably everyone to some degree is, is struggling with that. And there's limited mental health resources for people. So I was wondering yeah. if maybe you would share some things in terms of getting the getting because i think everyone's trying to get the train back on the tracks right now yeah and it seems like you're you would be a good person to ask for maybe some helpful hints in doing that um because as as you you and i know and a lot of people understand implicitly if not explicitly you know where your mind goes and where you allow your mind to dwell uh has causative or at least it has influence on how things yeah, actually yeah go. yeah well, one of the things, I hope this is helpful, and I definitely recognize that, you know, apropos of what you're saying. Um, and I think that I um, I and the rest of the culture didn't realize until it was too late what the COVID lockdown was doing to kids. I mean, the toll that it's taken on kids is just, um, it's tragic. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm learning about it more, you know, as, as time passes. What's the, uh, what's the latest with that? Well, just intellectually, you know, I mean, not no less emotionally, you know, it's her kids in terms of missing all that schooling, all the remote schooling. I mean, you know, uh, a whole generation of kids at this juncture is probably a year behind where they ought to be in reading and math and never mind kids with special needs. I mean, it's just I don't know how you get that back. Um, but we're all suffering from it, you know, uh, of all ages, all backgrounds and so on. So one of the things that has inspired me recently and talk about magic uh, and simplicity. Uh, I want to suggest a kind of a glove to try on. Um, one of the things I write about in the new book, and I also write about this in Daydream Believer, is a decade worth of experiments into precognition that was conducted by a clinical psychologist at Cornell named Daryl Bem. And uh, Bem published his paper on precog about, uh, gosh, mm, over a decade ago. And it's useful that he published that over a decade ago because his findings have since been confirmed in um, meta-analysis with, with 
basically 90 different trials in 33 different labs in 14 different nations. Um, they, they pooled together. Uh, they met the bar for statistical confirmation okay. of his findings. And so BEM, in short, uh, conducted uh, nine different experiments for precognition, but it was experiments eight and nine where the rubber really hit the road. He gave people these word lists to memorize, and he found, in short, that scores spiked, scores spiked um, in those instances where they would study the list in the future the so-called future after having already <laughs> taken the test. That's really bizarre. Yeah, it's fucking bizarre, and it's dead to rights accurate. And he said there was a retrocausal effect. It's just a few points. This is not Zeus throwing lightning bolts down at the Earth. But there was a retrocausal effect. The efforts that they put in in the future seemed to reach back in time so-called, and spike their scores in what we refer to as the present. Now, we've known since Einstein that time bends. And so as far out as all this sounds, uh, it, maybe it's not so far out. Uh, topic which I'll expand on another day. But for the time being, what BIM's data showed uh, is that at least according to replicable, replicable statistical evidence, very heavily ju juried parsed over and meta-analyzed, is that stuff you do in the so-called future can reach back in time and have a, a evince a cognitive spike or an improvement over stuff that you're doing in the present, which means that we do, in effect, get second chances. Now, I realize I'm describing all this in shorthand. I have an article called, Is Precognition Real? Uh, at Medium. People can read that. They can get more detail. There's more detail in Daydream Believer. There's more detail in modern occultism. Suffice to say, I'm describing all this in shorthand, but it's very defensible and it's very rational and, and logical. If you play by the rules of the road in terms of the gathering of stats, it takes us to a fantastical place, which is that time is not necessarily this linear uh, flowing river that we can never step into a second time twice. In fact, we can step into it multiple times again and again and again. So something that you're trying to work on in your life, whatever it is, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's um, a test, a quiz, something cognitive, maybe it's physical performance, maybe it's athletic performance, maybe it's wishing that you could have a second chance to make a good impression on somebody, whatever it is. Keep working at it, keep working at it, keep working at it with the warranted belief, the warranted belief that there is some kind of proven retrocausal effect, maybe just a little wrinkle, but what have we been describing of magic other than that? That it's a wrinkle, it's a wrinkle that it bets, that helps. Keep working on whatever it is you're dedicated to, and it might be able to reach back in time and do something. Uh, wow. That language sounds very far out. But when we actually break it down in terms of what we understand from testimony, from the 21st century, 20th century sciences, which are very perceptual based, it's not so far out. And I just want to ask people to try it. Maybe the easiest thing you ever do, and it may have radical and dramatic effects. Maybe a person has a relationship that suffered during a COVID. That may be redressed possibly by efforts that go beyond just the obvious evidence empirical ones there could be something that you're doing in the here and now that has a retrocausal effect maybe a kind of healing in a certain way so would you go back and imagine things happening in a different way or what what do you, uh... you continue to work at something for example there's a muay thai fighter a thai kickboxing came to me and he said he had nine days to a championship fight and he wanted to know is there something you can give me that'll help my mental game and i gave him a 30-day positive mind exercise. And he said, well, look, I'm going to do it, but I need something that's more short-term. And I said, this is short-term. This is short-term. Because if you keep doing this positive mind exercise after your fight, we have evidence that there could be a retrocausal effect that will improve your performance during the fight. He did it. How'd the fight go? He won. I don't know that I could take credit for it. His name is Spencer Hanley. It was a championship tie kickboxing match outside of Austin, Texas. 
And uh, he was so inspired by the exercise that, you know, fighters will choose their entry music and it's usually like some ear bleeding heavy metal or uh, techno, you know, rap or something. He came out to that Belinda Carlisle song, Heaven is a Place on Earth. He was totally <laughs> relaxed. So, That's great. That's yeah, an awesome yeah. story. So, so, so try it as something to experiment with. Um, we all have things that, that, oh, you know, I want to do this better or I wish I had done that better. It may be that time is not so unforgiving as we think. That That's a phenomenal statement. Uh, and uh, that is definitely something that I'm going to try. I mean, I definitely have had experiences that absolutely can confirm that retroactive causality is a thing. And yeah. also... You know, I think you could call it maybe like timeline hopping. You just get onto a different timeline where certain Love decisions it. happened differently. And I, I definitely feel Love like it. that's happened several times during my life. Um, and I, I've thought for a long time that a lot of what people think of as magic, and when I say magic, I mean the spooky parts, not the cultural parts, mm -hmm. uh, the actual spooky parts, uh, mm -hmm. which often tend to be overlooked in favor of the cultural parts. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that, I think, is time just engaging with time in a different way or yeah. like i was going to say time manipulation but that sounds maybe a little bit grandiose but uh it, it just kind of demonstrates that magic shows that there can be human the influence of human consciousness over time seems to be a thing i agree I agree. Yeah. This is, you know, uh, the one realm of absolute freedom that we have within our psyche. And let's not squander it. We can do these experiments and nobody will bother us. Uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, necessarily advise people be public about it. Um, you're not. Yeah, I wouldn't either. <laughs> what? I wouldn't either. Yeah. You don't want other people to police your own thought experiments. I mean, that's pretty grotesque. Yeah. Um, it probably shows, <laughs> shows you a lot about people, though. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. yeah. You, by the way, did you know that Mike Tyson came out on stage with Coil as his uh, opening music for a boxing oh. fight once? No. Yeah. I guess this goes back. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So if you look up Mike Tyson Coil, they, they're the videos on YouTube. This is like in the 80s, or he came out to like Horse Rotovator or something like that. Just That's to, wild. Just, he just wanted to wow. intimidate the hell out of it. It's just like this grinding and intestinal like noise. And uh, he just wanted to intimidate the hell out of his opponents. So. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, huh. so you would say that in terms of people redressing the, the damage of COVID, it's retroactively causing it not to happen? <laughs> retroactively causing it not to happen. Well, the, the choice is in front of the individual. You know, I mean, these small choices, like, I mean, Bem found results. This Cornell psychologist found results just by asking people to memorize a very simple word test just more in the future. You know, they didn't know what they were doing. I mean, this was all presented to them as a very mundane experiment to, for the most part. I mean, the subjects were were kind of blind as to what was being looked for. But that little wrinkle, that little wrinkle, it made a difference, made a difference. That's really interesting. I mean, I was yeah. just thinking this morning that life is very asynchronous. It's just like everything's yes. kind of happening. Like It's not like life is linear, at least in my experience of it. It's more like a bunch of loops they can like be put on hold and then gone back to, and then things are looping around each other all the time. Uh, and like, maybe you put down one interest for 10 years and then you come back to it and you're right back where you were 10 years ago, or maybe you don't see someone for 10 years and then you, you see them and you're right back to where you were, uh, then feeling all the same feelings you did 10 years ago. This for me kind of shows that life is more like a collection of themes that ha kind of have to work themselves out and they all have to jockey for time within one lifetime. So yes. they're all kind of like asynchronously trying to fight for freeway space, which is why it's good not to have too many interests. <laughs> well, I would, I would venture if I may too many relationships. I think most of us have too many relationships, which are very often conflictual. And, um, I think a person should experiment with, um, whether or not they could be happy with the least possible number of relationships. That's where my life is right now. And so far, so good. So, uh, I, I just think we are really overburdened by relationships, especially in the digital age. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most online relationships are fucking godforsaken. You know, so. <laughs> I don't know if those count as relationships. It's more like just, it's not relationships. It's I, I, I knew this was going to be, it was what? I don't know what to call it, you know, because it's not relationships. That's right. Yeah, I always knew it was going to be a mistake to turn the thing that we work into into 
uh, or or the thing that we played Doom on into the thing that we both work and have our most important social relationships right. on. Uh, right. I think actually just the fact that people were playing Doom on computers prior to the internet happening explains a lot about Twitter. Uh, right. All that energy got transferred into a uh, first person shooter versus people's reputations. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, it's funny. That's one of the reasons why I left Facebook. Like, I may have to put up with certain degrees of shit, but I will not reference people as friends, regardless of what Mark Zuckerberg tells me I have to. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Users, perhaps. <laughs> Users. Used. <laughs> yeah. They used. Um, well, great. Maybe that's a good place to put a bookmark in uh, another awesome podcast. So um, tell Pleasure. people, is the book out already? or uh, No, the book is out September 19th. Uh, it's up for pre-order in all formats, print, digital, audio. The audio link just went up, I think, this morning. Um, so you can pre-order the thing anywhere. And uh, pre-orders do help. So if somebody is so inclined, I'd certainly appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah, it definitely helps with that. Those first week on Amazon. First week on Amazon yeah. is everything based on that tells them how where they're going to put the book afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So Modern Occultism and all your other ones are, I'm sure, at your Amazon author page. They're all up there working on new ones as we speak. <laughs> all right. Trying to make it all work. <laughs> well, we we I can at least speak for myself. I admire your your consistent productivity. You're constantly Thank putting you. books out. Um, I'm still trying to put things together after writing the last one. <laughs> Just like as you know how it is. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, you achieved a lot with the last one. I mean, you you captured a span of history and a complex career in John D that um, most people are not courageous enough to approach. Well, I really appreciate that, Mitch. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And I wish you uh, awesome, awesome number one sat, uh, bestseller status luck with modern occultism. Thank you, man. I All appreciate right. it. Okay. I will talk to you soon, I hope. Talk soon. I okay. look forward to it. All right. All right. Bye, Mitch. Bye. All right. Hope you really, really enjoyed that. I definitely had a lot of fun in that conversation. Meet us at magic.me, M-A-G-I-C-K dot M-E, my school for magic, meditation, and mysticism, where you can learn all the skills you need to unleash your true self. I will see you in class. And until next time, hang in there.